Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Tell Us More live experience, uh, broadcasting live from Kilani in Johannesburg, South Africa. Special guest is from the other end of the country, uh, but before we get into that, let's talk about our first kind of interesting story for today. Uh, it's been a rough week for South Africans. First of all, um, lockdown regulations kind of being tightened, they're tightening the screw, we lost our access to liquor, to cigarettes, uh, uh, to visiting family, there's a curfew. Uh, but today, the straw that uh, broke the camel's back, chocolate log, is no longer being uh, put into production by Nestle. And South Africans have been having a terrible time struggling with this. They've taken everything away. Our freedom, our liberties, and now this lovely snack. I feel like that's how petty we've become now. We're fighting all the small things. We're just like, really, guys, just give us chocolate. I mean, you can you can keep the electricity. We only need that for three or four hours a day to boil our hot water and to help ourselves a lovely bath. But chocolate log, unbelievable. Shutting down newspapers, we can handle it. But this this is way too much. It's been a weird time because a lot of our comforts are disappearing slowly but surely, and, and we're having to reckon with what it's like to be with ourselves. So I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, when you look in the mirror, you don't freak out. I, You know what's weird about this lockdown? Whenever I see people's photos, uh, on social media. I'm like, no one here looks well rested. There's not a single person whose photo I've looked at on Instagram or whatever and be like, ah, this, this guy slept very well last night. Or this young lady, you all look like you're stressed. You've got bags under your eyes. Hairlines are doing some other shit. It's been really bad. In fact, yesterday I might have told you I cut my own hair and I'm going to say it again. I've never felt more violated in my life. Um, I didn't see the back of my head properly. I was on the wrong lever um my my uh, clippers were missing a guard i had two number two guards a number three and a number four so everything was just uneven i was very much disheveled i was also uh missing the comforting touch of my barber with that you know that methylated spirits that burns for those of you who've seen my stand-up you'll be very familiar with that sound of that ah, that hits you as you get a fresh cut so i'm a bit discombobulated i'm wearing this beanie Partially because it's cold. I I don't remember when last I had felt the breeze on my head. It's been at least 18 months. Uh, But just trying to manage and cope with what's going on in the world. But hopefully you guys will find an alternative to your uh, coveted chocolate log. Maybe in the form of a PS. Which was also like uh, a lot of people's love language when we were growing up. Remember, when you were too shy to tell somebody how you felt. You just went ahead to to the store. And you got a PS that said, will you date me? And then sometimes the person just ate the thing and didn't answer you. Then you just had to repeatedly buy more chocolates to uh, figure out if this thing would ever happen, if this relationship would happen. They all that pocket money down the drain to find out if someone would go to the dance with you. But uh, anyway, we, we're not going to harbor on too much about the loss of this cover to chocolate. We're going to introduce our first guest, who is an incredible comedian, storyteller, of course, also a medical doctor, joining us live all the way from the Western Cape. Please welcome to the show, the wonderful Riyad Musa. Dr. Mu. Yo. How are you, sir? Even more depressed than I was five minutes ago since you said chocolate log is no longer with us. Did you really eat chocolate log? When I see chocolates like that, I immediately think of diabetes. It's true. I haven't had it for a while yet. Like, there's a a nostalgic element to it. You know, I, I like a little bit of tears are welling up for some reason. I don't know why. (laughs) But like, no, it's like when I felt when they took away the tin foil around the Kit Kat. What? Are you, are you too, are you too young to know that? Like Kit Kat used to be wrapped in like, like a silver space blanket, uh, type of wrapping. It wasn't a plastic thing. Right. And what like a body bag, like a, that sounds like a body bag. 
<laughs> it's not no. It was beautiful. It is, I think it was made from material that took like the shuttle to space that Neil Armstrong used. It was amazing, like metal alloy. And what we used to do is we used to open it and we used to like break it right in between each segment, like sure. And then, and it was just like the full experience was like ethereal. It was amazing and. Yeah, I know. So that's gone. But now I'm, I'm feeling very old because you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm and, so confused. Yeah. Yeah. You need to Google that that stuff. Can we swear? I don't know. Because I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. This yes. feels like yesterday our guest was talking about Dragon Ball Z. And I was like, I don't know what you are referring to. I'm going to have to look this up. It's two days of things that I have no point of wait, reference. Wait, wait, wait. Is Dragon Ball Z like an old thing to you? I just missed it. I skipped it completely. Because Dragon Ball Z, to me, is like a thing that young people are interested <laughs> in. Right? Like, to me, that's that's from my perspective. So you, like, even past that, like, how old am I, bro? This is it. No, I, oh I was the Pokemon goodness. generation. I didn't have time for Dragon Ball Z. I just found it obnoxious that the storyline went nowhere. I, I, I have no idea what Dragon Ball Z is. Uh, my son is into Pokemon now. Uh, we drive around the whole day looking for all of these weird Pokemon prasa, and it's like hectic. <laughs> right? It's, it's really all come full uh, circle. tiring. I have to ask, Dr. Mu, what's the lockdown experience been like for you? I mean, you, you are with your family at the moment. What's kind of like the day-to-day -day for you guys? What, what's it like? Ah, dude, I need I need help. I need to somehow <laughs> escape this place. Uh, I need to get What's out. wrong? What's happening there? It's just it's just too much. My kids are driving me up the wall, right? <laughs> and I can't leave this place because I'm a medical doctor and I can't behave irresponsibly, right? So I can't go yeah. to like anything that normal people would do like and i've got my elderly parents with me here so like i'm essentially you know social distancing from them we like still behaving like it's like level nine lockdown you know <laughs> over here it's just crazy i would actually like spray the screen now with sanitizer you know just because i don't know <laughs> exactly how this thing is getting is being transmitted and i'm reading everything about it right yeah i know everything and we basically know nothing it's like a, it's a strange thing it's like i was thinking about you know we are learning as we go sure and this is what people don't understand people are pointing out all the uh, the ways uh, like the government is contradicting itself yeah you know but the issue is we don't know all right it's like yeah, okay. when, the, when vampires first arrived right okay and then the <laughs> yeah. vampires were trying people right and then okay. people go oh we need to stay in our houses right okay because the vampires are trying people but now they go we need to go out so they go out in the day and they realize okay we fine like so vampires don't come out in the day so then 12 people okay. go out at night then 11 people get charred by a vampire the 12 person didn't get charred by a vampire because he had a garlic cheetah for supper right so they put two and two together and they realize oh okay like garlic provide some degree of protection against vampires right and then also the other muslim a muslim a jew and a christian goes out right and yeah. the muslim and the jew gets charred but the christian gets protected and then they figure out oh it's a crucifix the crucifix protects you from a vampire but they were confused also because they thought it could have been the foreskin have something to do with the foreskin right but uh, it's not okay. it turns out it's the the crucifix so it's all like this we just finding all these different things out all the time and then that's exactly what's going on here that's my what you just said, what you just said is really stressing me out because what if the covid vaccine trials are just like that it's just like here foreskin and then it's like no that's not here crucifix no they do they it's a random stuff do you know like half of medicine is because like they were trying some other like they they tried like the uh, like some random treatment that just happened to help a person, you know, sure. like hydrochloroquine. Yeah. Like chloroquine is a malaria drug, and apparently it's apparently supposed to have helped certain people. But like, uh, you know, it's not like any they know the pathophysiology or how the thing works. It's just like we go, mm. okay, that person seems to be getting better. 
but it's got nothing to do one doesn't necessarily have to do with anything to do with the other so it's like um it's a confusing time so you're and suggesting like there's a lot of authority you're suggesting there's a lot of like false correlation between what people are using like like imagine somebody smoked a blunt and then felt better and then they were like oh this is this yes, this exactly. helps with, with the process Exactly. And also all the media that we get to the information that we get it always has a veneer of professionalism on it in a sense in that like mm. uh, uh, the thing that comes from the of, uh, like the uh, authority on the subject looks exactly as good as the thing that's just coming from a dude like who is actually uh, a conspiracy theorist, you know, ah. and uh, no one wants to listen to uh, look at graphs and stuff. Right. <laughs> like no one wants to like you listen to. Uh, like a, a, a one and a half hour lecture from sure. this slim, uh, what's his name? Uh, Prof. Salim. Is it Salim? Okay, but anyways, this professor, yeah. right? They come up with the whole thing about flattening the curve. No, people don't want to hear that. It's just the 5G or the 4G or whatever. Or Bill Gates is trying to do this to us. You know, it becomes easier to, <laughs> it becomes easier psychologically to deal with the fact that. Uh, you know, somebody out, people are use um, uh, conspiracy theories like as a yeah. psychological treatment. That's what they do. Well, if things seem, what were you saying? Well, that that point for me is like it's interesting that some people like can believe in those things because they just want answers, right? Isn't a lot of this is just people wanting answers? So when you hear a thing like uh, "keep your shoes outside because the virus comes in through your shoes." That's something that you can control and it makes you feel better about your experience. I never heard that one, bruh. Really? You haven't heard? Someone was saying like, I got this video. It's like a Jamaican woman who's supposedly a doctor. And she's like, the reason the COVID spreading is because the people oh, were God. wearing their shoes on the house, in the house. And someone sent it to me and was adamant that if you put your shoes outside, once you've done your shopping, you're mitigating some of your risk. <sighs> it becomes too stressful. <laughs> right? And look here. It's also got a, the thing that's very stressful to me is how different people like mm -hmm. um, deal with risk and how people um, utilize their own assessments, right? Sure. So, and how they interpret facts, right? And how yeah. families can have complete disagreements about this. And it can also be based on your personality. Like if you mm. are an uh, a extrovert, right? Being in lockdown is actually, it makes you vulnerable to um, loneliness, anxiety, mental illness, more so than an introvert, introvert uh, who, who would potentially be affected by it. Like an introvert has got some sort of resilience and fortitude from being locked up. It's like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Now we're chilling inside the house. Everything is cool. But an extrovert is not around, surrounded with people. Then, like, yeah, 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 I need to get out, <laughs> right? Out. Yeah. Yes. So it's and it's got to do with your psychological makeup. So um, it's it's just very confusing. And now there's no bloody shows anymore. I got four lighties. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like I'm trying to do this live stream, uh, like a show later on. But there's no like yeah. laughter. There's no laughter, right? Like I mean, That's I'm not performing from my uh, from a theater. I'm performing in my house. My toilet is right there. Like this is not what I expected show business to be this is not what i signed up for right i can't hear the laugh bruh. i can't hear the laugh i can hear the flushing this is a live the, you know the live there's this live stream like there where my sure. light is walks through and like drop the number one or two in the thing right and it's like it's I, it's, it's, it's it's anxiety provoking because i don't know when this thing you don't know when it's gonna end <laughs> and I'm, I'm a professional i'm a professional and i'm extreme the doctors are stressed out because the hospitals are like bursting at the seams you know all my it's getting crazy out there yes you know and we don't know because we outside mm. the hospital right and now my doctor friends are making me feel guilty about like not utilizing my medical degree you know and now uh, I'm like, you know, and i gotta i don't remember bro you're gonna put me there like i i don't <laughs> i can maybe tell people a couple of jokes right as they you know like gasp for a uh you know i mean that's a, that might not be a great idea that might not be very helpful if someone I, I don't think so yeah <laughs> so you were you were mentioning kind of this this gravitation towards performing in an online space i find this yes. 
all incredibly weird and bizarre. How have you found kind of like just talking into a thing and just hoping that the, the stuff lands? Uh, well, to a certain extent, um, I, I do have a little bit of resilience against this and a bit of experience uh, sure. doing like shows and, and not getting laughs. Well, um, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, you know, I've got like, uh, because I perform for a lot of uh, Indian Muslims from Durban <laughs> and, and they pack the place out. Like it's full, bruh. Like it's not hurting like my pocket. But when I stand in front sure. of these people, right, there's like there's not much feedback, bruh. <laughs> and, 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 and you don't feel it going through you. Like so I do shows in Cape Town. <sighs> you know, do shows like you do blacks only or something. <sighs> you know, and then you like do this Muslim show and it's like. Are you talking about Sibaya or is this somewhere else that we're thinking well, about? Well, Sibaya is one of the places, but like yeah. generally, dude, like you <laughs> like I will do a convention center show. Like so, yeah. so it's full, but then you feel there's no like feedback. Like it's no, it's like, it, and then afterwards, it's even more confusing because they come like, hey, Riyad, what a top show that it. was. <laughs> hey, what a top show. It was tops, man. I almost laughed, man. It was so good. <laughs> I loved it. You know, like and and so it's like a. I, to a certain extent, I'm used to it. But um, yeah, did I think something appeared on my my screen over there because I'm using my phone? Yeah, did you get a comment. Appeared? Somebody was sneaking into your DMs there. Yeah, it was like, and it could be an entanglement. Let me just. Uh, oh wow, that's. I mean. The, of what this you're the first person who we are kind of seeing a tour of their space. Where are you? Where are you? This is not a, this not a, a tour of the space. This is uh, above the garage, and there's, okay. a, there's a whole lot of like it's a storage area. And I uh -huh. I'm gonna turn this into a a studio, uh, but of course I haven't done that yet. But that <laughs> is the we're not judging. Take your time. This is a safe space. Um, Riyad, I wanted to chat to you. You've got a couple of kind of shows that are on Netflix at the moment. One of them is Comedians of the World. I particularly want to talk to you about kind of, I think prior to this lockdown, you were trying to or maybe just dabbling in uh, being a kind of international act. I wanted to know, what's that, what was that experience like for you? Because I think there's a lot of kind of nuances to performing here and abroad. What was that experience like for you kind of dabbling into those spaces? Well, Primarily, my accent is a fucking problem, bruh. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, but it can also be an asset. Sure. It can be an asset. So, um, if I don't talk about my accent up front, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, mm -hmm. like, uh, I, I, I didn't realize that I have such a strange accent. I, because where I'm from, like, I'm actually what they call sturvy, which is sort of uppity. Uh, so called, you know, colored as a colloquialism. Is that like, posh? like, are you posh? Uh, really? more, more a posh, uppity, English speaking, sure. uh, colored, English okay. speaking, right? Uh, and uh, there's, you know, uh, no front teeth references, you know, no, the non no front teeth people, like uh, from sure. my day, right? Um, so, um, this is uh, uh, so the accent is a problem, yet at the same okay. time, it can be beneficial, I, I think, because it sets you apart. But uh, I find if I don't, you know, talk about that up front, it's more like, like we, what, what is this guy? Like he says <laughs> he's from South Africa, but he looks Arab, but he says he's of Indian descent, he's English speaking, but yeah. he talks like. He, I, I need subtitles, like what the hell is in front of me over here, right? So yeah. I actually have to, you know, talk about that in detail beforehand, um, before I can get uh, on with the show. And then I find once I do that, then people yeah. go with me. And um, because I'd been to Montreal um, uh, a couple of times before, and I always felt I never connected with the audience. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then when we were doing the Netflix thing, when we had like four shows to prepare, wow, that's yeah. loads of it. Now you're doing a 30-minute special and you've got <laughs> four eight-minute shows at like two o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, wow. That's a lot of good preparation. But I, I, I decided to like talk about like my, uh, my accent, you know, mm. at the start. And then I found that luckily, you know, when I did that, I actually connected with the people much better. And it felt like home. It felt like I had control, like I, I, I do here. Um, and that was fortuitous, but it was very, very lucky because, you know, you need uh, experience to perform for different audiences. Sure. And especially if you don't have an understanding of how they perceive you, um, that only comes from experience and, you know, and, 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 and learning um, through performing. I feel you. I mean, like I, I watch the specials. I thoroughly enjoy them. I will say this: the the major one of the major contributions of the Netflix uh, special is that now in our house we all say titties. We uh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that, that that doesn't that that never worked. That doesn't work here. Really? Yeah. That <laughs> I don't even know what did I exactly even say. Uh, it was something so. about enunciation, but you were using that word in particular to yes. kind of explain how it's different in, in the two parts of the world. Yes, and then I said it in my accent, right? Yeah, yes. as well as in the American <laughs> accent. Yes, Your like I never do that and year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the flatness. You see, it's, it's actually I've like, I've, I've figured out it's based on the flatness of the accent. There are very few flat accents uh, sure. in the world. I think like New Zealand has an element of flatness, but there's mm. nothing as plot as a Cape Townian uh, accent, you know, and, and it's, it's very different to most of the accents uh, in the United States because like they will listen to a, a, a like some random a Mexican dude that's just like uh, crawled over the border, you know, or sure. dug a tunnel or something, and you'd make more sense uh, than I do. You know, and it was also weird. Then, uh, since that uh, that time, I I I I watch my old bits up where I'm I'm making fun of Sir Alex Ferguson's accent. Yeah, about the fact that he's got this really thick Scottish accent. But then when I watch it back with the <laughs> lens of how people see me, my accent is more confusing than uh, than his accent. So. So there's a, a lot of a lot to learn from. But I think, you know, I was just lucky that, you know, I connected with that audience. Yeah. I like, just lucky. And like I was just surprised and I enjoyed myself so much because they laughed a lot. And I but I know it was luck. It could have gone you know, very I mean, it worked out. It was a fire special. I think they had a great time. It was interesting to watch you translate kind of your experience here to there. And I think that self-awareness you spoke about is really important. Um, and the other thing I wanted to kind of chat about, what's going on I'm, there? I'm going to do something stupid now. Okay, just let me. Cool. Uh, this I'm is interesting. Gonna... Let's see this. Sorry. I'm just going to, what, what I'm doing Yeah. Uh, is I put it on airplane mode. Yeah. Because my wife is phoning me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, oh, is everyone looking for you? Have you tried to run away from your family? What's going on? This is so bizarre. I'm on top of the garage, dude. <laughs> Right, this is the only privacy I get. This and the toilet, right? And the toilet, I don't even get privacy there. Like I sit for like two seconds, you know. I'm halfway into the first, uh, you know. Okay, and um, <laughs> like hey! doof, doof, doof. like my toast is not the same size. My son is oh, upset no. me the other day because the toast, and it's not uh, that I cut the toast because I understand, you know, cut the toast into a half, right? Sure. And then, if you're sharing it between kids, people people want e equitable distribution, right, of toast resources, right? Uh -huh. But it was his own toast. You had had both pieces. So he was upset that his own toast, the one piece and the other piece, wasn't the same size. <sighs> this is so bizarre. I feel really bad now. I feel like we have to rescue you and put you in another quarantine facility. But I think you'll be okay. I think... I think before these things were going okay and they're going to be fine afterwards. And in fact, I wanted to talk to you about something that's popping up very soon. Uh, Material, which was a great movie. First of all, I want to let you know, my mom, when like she wasn't sure about what stand-up really was like and then she watched that movie and then she had a whole new perspective. How many people do you have like spoken to you about that? Like kind of that movie helping them translate what they do for a living to someone who maybe didn't quite get it. 
I think people um, connected with um, the realness that, that mm. just felt like uh, it, it, it echoed real life. Um, and I know a lot of people in Johannesburg specifically spoke about that. It just felt so mm. real. Um, my personal experience with my parents is completely the opposite. My parents were <laughs> super, very supportive. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, as long wow. as I worked hard, like my dad was happy for me to do sure. whatever I needed to do. Right. Mm. Um, but one of those guys, like we come with like 90 percent of the test, he will ask you where's the other 10 percent. Like, <laughs> you know, like proper old school Indian, like you know, you have yeah. to achieve, you know. My pop was um, the same, he was also like an like <laughs> I'm not forcing you to achieve, but like just you know, I did this, I did it. Sure. Right. Ah, here's my marks. There's my marks. I did it. What what are you doing? Why 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 are you not working now? Why are you sitting watching television? Why? What's you know, you got so, so many more hours. I used to study right up until you know we started the exam, you know. So wow. it's that sort of like pressure through trying to, you know, live up to the, the example of your father. So I mm. had a lot of that, but never like, like, you think my life was a joke, Kasim? <laughs> <laughs> joke. It wasn't and like dramatic. Ah, and telling jokes about my life, you know, or none of that, you know. <laughs> I didn't have any of that, you know. Uh, I mean, it's a actually, beautiful story. Like, yeah, people think I acted well in that scene, right? I wasn't acting, bra. That that Vincent bra was shouting at me, and I was <laughs> pooping myself for real, right? That's a real fear you see in my eyes. It's the first time he screamed. We only, we shot that in the first week, right? Really? And people look at that and go, "Yo, Riyadh's a natural, right? He, he just knows how to act. No experience, nah, bra. I literally pooped myself when he screamed at me." Uh, he was okay. just a, was a powerhouse performance, you know. Mm. And I mean, the story uh, was, sorry to interrupt, but you, you're talking about the authenticity of the story. And I don't know, have you seen Rami yet on HBO? Oh, yeah, Rami is amazing. You know, what did I, you think of that? I, I love the artistic aspect of it. I think mm -hmm. it's a little bit too um, uh, edgy um, and provocative from an Islamic perspective. So, mm. for example, Rami would echo um, like Sami's experience. Yes, kind of younger Muslim that sort of, experience. That generation, you know. Mm. Um, uh, whereas with me, it's a little bit like uh, too much uh, in the sense of you know the world in which he grows up in. So I, I had a more sort of a conservative approach to it. But I guess it's only because I'm like was one of the first like Muslim, if not the first Muslim comic here in South Africa. So I really had to tread the, the, the line, which is mm. interesting because like I never swear, swear, swore use profanity. I generally used more uh, family orientated material, yet sure. I got a lot more hate than most <laughs> other comedians. Like, really? Yeah, like uh, Loisa used to laugh at me, you know, because like I, I used to like, I did this Osama bin Laden sketch on uh, late night news with Louise. Oh, yes, with Louis, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was like a mess in the Muslim community. Like, I mean, I got death threats and stuff. You know, it was hectic. You that's can bizarre because you, you seem like such a wholesome person. Like, who would want yeah, to fight you? Exactly. That's why it was so funny. <laughs> and, and, and like, I was like getting death threats. You can see I've got like an apology video. Uh, on on YouTube, I, I come across looking at like 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 uh, Indian Michael Jackson over there. Like I'm really sorry, I never did. You look at this. If I look at it, it's like it's hilarious, right? And, um, and I don't know. And I, I guess you know. And there's still people within the Muslim community uh, that hates me, and they think I'm like um, a kafir or an unbeliever because I, I mm. tell jokes, you know. Um, so, so uh, you had like a, a fatwa declared on you, like Joey, because Joey went through some shit a couple of years ago. Yeah, but you see, like now, you see, this is the interesting thing: is where people don't um, understand artistic expression. So, for example, sure. Rami, Rami, 
in this uh, in our audience right could get the same sort of response yeah. Yeah. yeah that joe is getting right mm. or got under those circumstances now for me i go like uh what was interesting uh, about joey is that he was very angry at some point right and it came out okay. in his humor right yeah, yeah. and it yeah. made him super funny like he yeah. was always funny but at, 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 at his humor metamorphosed there was a metamorphosis right yeah, or to sure. a certain extent uh, like um, amalgamation of the silliness and like just very profound concepts and ideas right yeah, yes. and 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 with a with a foundation of anger right that just made him hilarious especially in an audience that had no inhibitions so if uh, i put him for example on a show where uh you know everybody's coming there it's mixed audience it's mm. on a saturday night you know mixture of young old people different races right destroys kills like just he had this <laughs> one 20 minute set right that just destroyed every time right sure. absolutely right and 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 then you put him in a muslim audience right just like Wah! right within the first few minutes it's quiet because they become sensitive and when people become very sensitive they can't laugh well i think i think there's an inverse like relationship between who you are and the audience like if you're different there's a weird like leeway or juxtaposition like i know from playing gigs in joburg in front of a muslim audience there's lots of stuff i can say and then be like i'm sorry that was haram yes. you know like yes. oh it was my crew yes. and i'm like yes. mouth mouth you know and it's like yes. that guy and, and i'm and i'm kind of super aware that i can get away with a lot more stuff than maybe more. if like suhail was there and then the people are just like wow heavy days definitely you know because uh, the muslim guys are the same i mean there's mm. naughty guys and then there's more prim and proper guys you know and uh, uh so uh and everybody's got a sense of humor so um and and they are more forgiving of you know supposed outsiders yes um but like especially i'm held up to a very very high standard in terms of like how i'm supposed to um conduct myself and especially what i'm supposed to talk about sure so i'm I, so so you find like i i i i'm really drawn to complicated concepts and debates right yeah but i, I have to put it across in a way that's palatable to a conservative audience so a good example of that is like i i got this piece on castus amenia right yeah. that is on um, uh, life begins now it's a more complicated argument right and sure. it ends, ends off with like uh madiba you know swearing you know um and and that's sort of the sure. the the big punchline um uh in this whole routine and mm -hmm. uh you know some people it usually you know it's the build as such that you know I usually get a massive response there but then there's always people who are offended by it. the fact that i utilized uh profanity um wow. and 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 it's very like i hardly do but you know i i don't have any thing against it like my favorite comics you know uh use profanity i i i just believe in as you say like authenticity i mean if the sure. person would behave like that like and i don't swear a lot you know but if no, a, no. a swear word yeah and they came out like what's the big deal who cares as long as you're being real and authentic and i think that's the main thing and people can't understand that people always will say you know riyad you not like that all these other they if this if that they can't <laughs> tell a joke they can't tell a joke without if this if that and me like me, meanwhile like i'm loving all the comedians that yeah I, like i don't even hear it i just look at like the quality of the joke you know um, that's a, that's an interesting thing for me sorry Riyad, is that like you you're talking about this idea of height and accountability one and kind of it sounds like you have to na navigate uh, complex topics with a little bit more finesse and i kind of like yeah. i get where you're coming from because i've got a bit about like about uh, transitioning and like i have to be very careful at every point in that bit but for me i 
often find that the more exciting part of the process where it's like, how can I find and piece together this really complicated concept and make it consumable for someone who wouldn't really think about something like that? Exactly. So the yeah. thing, the issue about that is, you know, people usually laugh when they agree with you. When the sure. punchline is consistent with their belief system, they mm. laugh, you know? And um, and if if they don't agree with you, right? Like as a comedian, you can also still go, that's funny because of how sure. the joke is structured. But you yeah. won't necessarily laugh out loud because it, it sort of contradicts uh, a deeper belief that you have. You know, and then on the other hand, you know, you can say something that's not even a joke and you can elicit laughter, you know, you know, the clapping laughter <laughs> where, you know, like Trevor's really good at that, right? Sure. Trevor's really good at that because he knows who he's performing to. He's performing to this liberal American audience, right? And, right, he's able to play that very, very well when he needs to, you know? Sure. Is 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 extremely efficient and proficient at it. And he understands it perfectly, right? And yeah. then he can be like he plays plays all um, angles, and that's absolutely amazing how he does that. Now, um, it's it becomes very difficult uh, when when also your box into um, the Muslim comic. You so know, I actually wanted to ask you about that, this idea of like you don't choose your audience, your audience chooses you and what that implies for you as a creative individual. Like I sometimes mm -hmm. will be in a room and be like, oh shit, I can't be mad. These people like me and do I give them what they want or, mm -hmm. or do I do this new style, new wave that might kind of, you know, alienate them, but it's good for maybe my personal growth. I, I think it's a bit of both. Um, mm. because you need to you need to grow as an artist. I hate using the word artist, I read it's so pretentious. <laughs> but you need to grow um and get better creatively. Sure. Um that's well I I I need that. Um so I always feel I need to understand the art form better. I need to be able to have more tools at my disposal. Um and uh, in order to do that, you got to step over the line, right? Now, sure. I've always skirted around the line, always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, as time goes on, I continue to step over the line, and I'm less anxious when I misstep. You know, okay. when, when I started out, I would get very, very nervous, and I would, I, I would beat myself up a lot, and I would go over my motivations. Um, and with I was writing my argument and everything, you know, because I'm, um, but now I'm less anxious about it. Sure. I still do that, however. I always try and listen to the argument that a, a more conservative person will come up with where they're offended by something. I listen to it because I usually find when I can utilize what they say, mm. I can add an element to the routine, you know, add an extra joke in there that sort of, um, preps the person for the punchline or the thing that's offensive um, uh, to sort of soften the blow um, and therefore um, it's a greater chance of actually getting the laugh. Well, that's like, interesting. I think a lot of people in the current society aren't willing to engage with anyone whose opinions oppose their own. And so like that seems like a very valuable thing. What, what do you feel about this idea? Because I now feels like the time where it's like, Riyadh says something, I don't agree. I unfriend him, I unfollow him, I don't talk to him. It's a really bizarre time now. What do you think of kind of engaging with different sides of, of, of an ideological argument? So, for example, um, people think there's one argument where they go, um, it's freedom of speech, right? Yeah. And, you mm -hmm. know, just say what you need to say freely and everybody should be afforded that right. Sure. And through that, you know, um, we would actually find truth. And as a collective on aggregate, we decide how to move forward as a society. Mm. Right? Okay? okay. Which is a great idea. But then, like, for example, a guy, um, like, you've, 
go for example like a ricky gervais argument he will just say no i'm just going to say it like this and this is how i want to say it and i feel comfortable with how i want to say it all right mm. now which is great and it, it produces really cool comedy you know which yeah. is very confrontational but you know he comes across like i mean he still he doesn't come across like a harsh guy you know so um uh like it's it works for him now in terms sure. of my my way to deal with it is like mm. i want to make the material uh bulletproof to all um opinions um, okay <laughs> you want to cover I, all bases almost i i really i'd want to and i take on the challenge i don't get it right you know but but that's that's my ideal my ideal is to actually go okay i'm not just going to focus on the freedom of speech argument although i believe in it sure right i'm going to go okay i'm going to i want to say this thing but i'm yeah. going to listen to whoever is offended by it and try and adjust my material to okay. include them in the people who are laughing uh, because i think you know if they can identify with the humanity of where my bits are coming then mm -hmm. they can laugh at it like for example it's a simple thing about like when i did the prayer i do this prayer um this adhan uh, the uh, the call to pray um but uh, in yeah. my special where uh, my little kid uh, did the allah akbar right the, the muslim call to pray when he was mm -hmm. very very young right and then i would a person impersonate how he does that right now a lot of people would find that offensive because they think i'm mocking the call to pray mm, i see what you mean the so a lot of Muslim yeah. people would go this guy is mocking the call to pray although when they see my son perform the call to pray right the it's it's very endearing most muslim people who see this little child two year mm. old performing the call to pray it's it's the sweetest thing in the world right sure. and all i'm doing is i'm making fun of how he says it as opposed to the call to pray itself so uh, so so the way in which i have to do it i really have to prep the audience for what i'm going to do especially in a conservative audience right yeah. so that uh the the joke hits home because if they can connect with the sweetness of it initially and then yeah. the edginess that i bring afterwards right they will go with but if they don't connect with the sweetness it will just come across then these guys are chasing me like Javier Razdin in hey, love you like, <laughs> yeah so well, so well, and it, and yeah. it's born out of the fact that I was one I think also one of the first guys and I, I'm I'm more sensitive about um you know I I think I have the responsibility I'm like the big brother in the situation you know I have to behave in a proper way and how do you feel about it? Do you feel like obliged or is there, are there moments where you feel like you just want to let loose? Because that idea of accounted, uh, like heightened accountability can be a heavy burden to carry on your shoulders. Some days you just want to be like, fuck this. I want to do a joke that's got bad politics. That's got like just I'm punching. Like I wish I yes. some days I'm like, I wish I could just do some comedy where I just punch down for five minutes of my yes. career and then <laughs> carry on. No, but look here. I... Uh, what I did was I changed recently how I did things. Yes. Because um, I was one of the guys, you know, how people get into comedy is very different. So I was one of the guys who started doing comedy and, you know, rel got relative success early on. Like I got laughs early on. Sure. Like when, and then you're the headliner. And when you're the headliner, <laughs> you want to kill, right? And because you're the headliner, you want to kill all the time you don't um uh risk as much on stage sure. Sure. you need laughs all the time you become uncomfortable with the silence you know um uh, you are less willing to uh, improvise uh with the audience you know and that mm. that's only born from the fact that you know um you have this expectation so I consciously tried to change how I did things with my other special where I would go and because I'm not particularly comfortable with it because I'm also I'm so sensitive about not offending people. Okay. I, I, I want people to laugh. I don't want to offend people. 
So I, I have to be very careful, yet I still want to say edgy things. Yeah. This is a weird thing. I do want to say things that are slightly edgy, but I do not want to offend you. Okay. <laughs> So it's, I'm in a, a weird predicament. So what I would do is I would just go to the um, the armchair theater when we could do stand-up shows and I would just Rest talk as opposed to prep. I think that's gone, right? Yeah, as opposed to pre prep before, you know? Uh, yeah. And I uh, would just talk and I'd never done that before. And, and it was very liberating and um, I really enjoyed how I built my my uh, comedy special doing that um but you know what the difficulty is now because i'm spending most of the time with my kids and mm -hmm. you know when we were doing corporate gigs and so on i would be a very little time to actually go to the comedy clubs which is you know the most perfect place for for uh to try for stand it out and stuff yeah yeah so so uh i'm i'm hoping you know once you know i probably once they're a little bit bigger uh, I'll be able to do more of that again. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, in the meantime, we're going to have to deal with this new medium, the digital medium, you know, uh, uh, and uh, figure that whole thing out. But like stand-up as a performance, art form. That's what sure. it is. I mean, yeah. you, can, you can be a great writer, but in order to perform stand-up well, you need to get out in front of a crowd and, you know, feel... Uh, uh, what the audience is giving off. Yeah, I think there is that kind of rhythm that you people forget about when it comes to live performance, that it's a dance that you're doing with mm. the people in the room with you. Um, what's interesting about what you just said, it sounds like you're constantly aware of the idea of being a prisoner of one's success, and you're constantly trying to get away from that. Well, what advice do you have to people who are like trying to get out of a rut? Because, you know, we're in this lockdown. I think a lot of, you know, at the beginning, I, I suspected a lot of people would regress just because of the conditions we're in. So, Dude. so what do you think people Everybody's do? regressing, bro. Hey? Like, did you see, like, did you see, you think everybody's looking tired? Did you see Will Smith, bro? <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but... Oy. Dude, I've, I've never been... seen him look like that, bro. Like, <laughs> and, and I don't necessarily know whether it was what Jada was talking about, with it was the lockdown because he was looking on Instagram, he was also looking like that for a couple of like months, weeks before, yeah, before. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> and like everybody is like, and and uh, this is the issue also about being locked down. There are mm. mental health issues, it's not just about protecting ourselves from the virus, sure. it's there are mental health issues about you know being inside. We are social creatures, right? And um. Uh, now we are socially distant and the opposite things are we, we have to re reconfigure manners mm. you know it's weird sure. it's rude to want to shake someone's hand you know <laughs> it's it's you know it's good manners to dress like you're gonna rob a shop you know like <laughs> you know it's weird hey yeah Mark it's very really strange everything. and like and different people get like this whole mask thing also. Like uh, it, people, it, it, I hate the debate about it, you know? Sure, sure. It's very, uh, I, I get irritated when I see like the, the nose sticking out. Like I understand, I understand it's difficult to wear a mask all the time and sometimes a mask doesn't fit in it. But it's like, for me, when I see it, it's like, you know, you, you, you know you've got your underpants on, right? And then... <laughs> And yeah. and there's something else hanging out that it shouldn't like. I get the same. I, I don't like it. It's uh, and, <laughs> and 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 the, the mask is primarily to protect the other person. It's to this protect. Is, if you've got the infection, it's to protect the other person. Yes, that's yeah. that's essentially what it is. And for people who don't believe, right, that social distancing can work, right? Like the, you mustn't complain if someone farts in the elevator. Right, <laughs> if someone stands next to you, like it, it's it's just physics, you know. If you stand yeah. far away from someone, the, the the virus can't get to you, right? That's 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 it. It's not an airborne thing, right? The For only sure. problem is is that you don't know who's carrying the thing. It's not like venom, you know, venom when venom infected Sim like symbiosis. A person. Yeah, and then the person, <laughs> you know, then you can see okay, there's something off with this bra, you know. But most people carrying the virus look normal. 
So, so we just assume that everyone has got the thing, you know? Yes. Um, so uh, I don't know, like, how to deal with all of this. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think I'm dealing with it very well. Uh, okay. All I know is that comedy is born out of tragedy as long as you can survive. Uh -huh. So all you need to do is figure out how to survive over this period. Sure. Figure out how to survive. Keep moving forward because it's going to most likely pay off in a, a, a couple of months or in a year and a half because there's going to be so much fodder for, for material. There's, mm. there's so much for, uh, fodder for humor because that's is essentially what happens after a tragedy, you know? So, and I think also all the multiple other opportunities will emerge, for example, in this online space, mm. right? We will, it's a, it's a, people say it's new and normal, it's a new abnormal, right? Yeah, it's, new abnormal. I don't like the yeah. new normal as an idea. Yeah, I, I don't like, like that at all, right? Sure. And because you don't even know what's normal yet, we like renegotiating that. We had mm. like eons, uh, well, thousands of years to figure out what is good manners and now and what what's a good way to interact with each other and now we're having to uh, uh, adjust that whole thing sure. you know so um so i just think you know survive uh do what you can to survive and know that especially for comedians or i can say with comedians that yeah. comedy is born out of out of uh, tra tragedy and difficulty and there's going to be a lot of like jokes that come out of this thing. And then we're gonna laugh about it, you know, we're gonna laugh about it. And I think it's gonna make make us stronger comics, you know? Hopefully, uh, if, if people don't crash before then, that's my yes, biggest fear. Yes, like, this is the but, thing. But I, yeah, it's like that stresses me out a lot. At ease, because I mean, like, uh, how do your livelihood just sort of disappears, I guess? Um, mm. Like, I'm, I'm like, uh, really trying to figure this whole thing out, like, um, you know, am I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about if I need to do some form of medicine, you know, um, Interesting. what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? like I can't do <laughs> like actual medicine, but li like maybe, you know, cause I, I, I can speak doctor, right? You know, the jargon and the lingo. I know the jargon, you know, yeah. so I can speak doctor and I can speak human being, okay. you know, so hopefully I can like. You know, maybe uh, decipher complicated medical concepts, talk to people about like certain medical ideas in a palatable and easy to understand and maybe humorous way. So sure. I think that's also an idea that was created uh, or was born out of this lockdown. And mm. I, I think it actually could be something that um, could put me in a category of one. It was always like, I've almost always done that, you know, you, you, instead of competing with people, you just put yourself in a category of one, makes yourself yeah. as unique as you can, uh, and then do that, you know, I um, feel you. Yeah, yeah. you know, so, um, so I think I'm going to try and do that. Um, cause then I got a weird accent. I now got a weird accent. Go now, on, yeah. That's one thing. And if I'm a, I've got a medical degree, I just don't remember anything. So maybe I just have to study a little bit, all right? Another and, seven years to yeah, refresh or just, my memory. You know, <laughs> or just get a researcher and put a script there and, you know, I can come across as intelligent, um, but not really. So as long as there's no Q&As, if I will avoid Q&As, um, but come across as very knowledgeable, uh, like on any people ask me questions like yeah. online, like doctor, what do you do this? I'll Google it or I'll phone someone, <laughs> you know, my one of my, my sister or my parents and get an answer. Um, now I won't, I won't put myself, a, I, I, I won't portray uh, that I know what's going yes. on, but I will, I will say that, you know, I can, you know, I have some deeper understanding of this, but hopefully I can uh, explain it to you in, in an entertaining way. And then maybe You're just get disseminating like the information for the people. Yeah. That, I mean, that would be, uh, that would be a great thing to watch. I think that'd be really interesting. These are interesting times. We're all trying to figure out like what works, what the next wave of content is. Is there really a need for content? But 
I think what you brought up earlier was the idea of like us focusing on surviving and not being too harsh in ourselves. Yes. And we like, can be patient. I think that's it. Yeah. I think we can also get stressed out. You know, like uh, we are very lucky in terms of the, the support that we have, especially people in the middle class. Obviously, it's mm. extremely hard for, you know, uh, people who are living in dense sleep, like extremely like on top of each other, which is like horrible. You think like people in, in South Africa, in Cape Town here, in Kailitra, sure. Mitchell Plain, they mm. being the hardest hit, right, mm. by the pandemic, you know, because they can't practice social distancing because mm. people live on top of each other. There's lots yeah. of people in like one house, right? And, and people can't practice social distancing. So that's based on like a, a, you know, a first world scenario, which is why we had to go back uh, and open up mm. early. What we did was we prepped the hospitals as much as we could. And now we're opening up. We, then we had to open the economy because you can't protect people by starving them. Right. That makes no sense. Right. So yeah. we had to do that. Yeah. And social distancing doesn't work. And it's weird now. Everybody, it's, it's, it's doing most damage in those communities. And they never brought it there, bro. They weren't like skiing in Yes, it was 10 people Europe. who were like, who just came back from a ski holiday. Yeah, that's how it got here. I didn't get from China here. I didn't get no bra uh, from Kai Licha. I was chilling in China. And then now all of a sudden now uh, he brought the thing back. No, it came out from there. So we had to now... Uh, so people have to take some sort of... Uh, you know, I think responsibility to try and behave as responsibly as we can, but it's extremely hard because it's because there are multiple factors that make up a person's health, your mental yeah. health being um, paramount as well. So yeah. uh, it's it's very confusing. All of this, you know, it's very confusing. I, I think that's. Um... A great way to kind of end this to let people know that it is a bizarre time. I think we all have to acknowledge that in the first place because this idea of normal, I think everyone needs to get rid of that idea. This is not normal. This is really bizarre. Um, like you said, we have to take care of our mental, not be hard on ourselves and just try to survive. And hopefully we'll get through this. You know, there's there's hope. I think that's the thing. We're not that's hard to kind of communicate to people no, the idea what? of being hopeful. No, look here, like the 1918 Spanish flu, bruh. Yeah. It killed, uh, like, was 50 million people. Sure. 50 million people. And that would translate to hundreds of millions of people today. Mm. Right? And mm -hmm. now, what we are able to do, what we were able to do, is we were able to, um, uh, because we can communicate digitally, we can sure. continue. Mm. We, we, at, at least we can continue like they did practice social distancing uh, they had those techniques back in the day like there's this big story about on uh, one side of America uh, the uh, they said there was this virus that was coming and they mm. need to cancel this big parade right Ooh, I saw that it's like a tale of two cities literally how yeah, they responded exactly. to the pandemic so the yeah. one decided to shut everything down and they were protected and the other city didn't and you know mm. thousands of people died within a couple of weeks you know and mm. and we have the opportunity especially certain people with a lot of privilege in order to protect ourselves sure. more than most people on earth so i think we must be thankful uh thankful about that um and we should be like we could try and practice gratitude uh it's very difficult it's yeah. hard you know but um uh, but uh, it's like I think we we do have some sort, of, and it's not. This is not an existential threat. That's what everybody uh, is saying. We mustn't worry yeah. about the coronavirus wiping out humanity. Um, yeah. But um, uh, and and it's like you know, so many things so irritating about this this virus. You know, it's what do so you mean? You see it here? It's so confusing. Like. Like a, uh, that, Lee, the kids are fine, right? Yeah. So it's weird. The kids are fine. Well, are they? That's the other thing. Are they fine? Because now they studies are, are questionable about that. Uh, I, no, as far as I know, the kids are fine. Like, I mean, uh, they get a mild form of it uh, most times. And hardly okay. any children have passed away. And, you know, most times they have 
And I think it's got to do with the immaturity of the um, immune system. But it's weird, like, because, like, with the 1918 Spanish flu, uh, mm -hmm. younger people died. Younger yeah. people died. Cytokine uh, storm, that kind of stuff. Yes. And the older people didn't die. Right? That's mm -hmm. weird. Um, yeah. Because the older people, I think, had the, the theory is that they had ex they were exposed to a similar type of virus when they were younger, that the sort of demographic in the middle missed, right? So when mm -hmm. this a similar virus emerged, they had some sort of um, resistance, well, the protection against the virus that the younger people didn't have. So, okay. yeah, dude. It is what it is. It's all exhausting. It's all tough, but we have to keep on keeping on and trying to do our best to survive these times. Uh, Ria, thank you for joining us. Uh, first and foremost, it was a great chat. I think it's it's fascinating how everyone's trying to navigate this whole thing. But before we leave, there was a question somebody asked earlier in our comments. I wanted to know who your favorite international comedian was. That's from Sbonello and uh, Piri. Who is your favorite act before we, we, we love you and leave you on this uh, episode? International comic. At yeah. the moment, you, you know, I, I love all sorts of comedy, all right? Sure. And, you know, like, um, I just have a soft spot for Chris Rock. You know, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I, I just find that, you know, I find that, you know, Chappelle is obviously the king. Oh, that's my guy. Chappelle, Chappelle destroys, right? But I have such a soft spot for 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 Chris uh, Chris Rock because I find his material just connects more mm. uh, with me. Like I, mm. I just understand what he's saying, and and there's so much um, truth in 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 his humor. Like it just just it hits me more than um, than than Chappelle stuff. Although the comedy is just like next level and the the output that he has is like crazy you know crazy yeah. you know um and uh but like i've always had a soft spot for like it's a weird thing uh of chris rock and jerry seinfeld oh wow jerry's and, like an act that i didn't really watch as a youth so because as so you said <laughs> rock and chappelle it feels very generational like who people yes. pick yeah, so so Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld. If I think like my favorite two comedians, if uh, it's not my currently current fam favorite sure. comedian, my current favorite comedian is Bill Burr, right? Okay, um, yeah, yeah. But but um, like over the years and the styles that I like connect with is is Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld, and um, I like I like Seinfeld's. Uh, the meticulous aspect with which he, he approaches jokes. Mm -hmm. And I like I reworks jokes all the time. I find I do that all the time. I always try and figure out the best way to communicate something. And and I just, I, I love the, uh, the art of a, writing a joke. It's like just that process of, of, of creating a joke and performing it for the first time. Sure. That, that, that was my but my bliss that I found when I was in fourth year medicine, you know, always feeling I, I enjoyed uh, medicine and I always wanted to be a doctor. But then I just found this thing that just captivated me and, and you just all consuming. And even now yeah. I find if I don't write a joke, if I don't write jokes, I get sad. Oh, really? I think, I think I'm a melancholic person underneath and, and, <laughs> And writing jokes actually provides me with, um, like, it prevents me from, you know, uh, just, you know, being depressed. <laughs> you know, uh, kind of uh, relief. yeah, it's 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 a very therapeutic for me. Mm. That's, I mean, I I feel like I need to go write. I haven't written in eons. Um, I need to get my pen and paper out. Yeah, and yeah, and then because I'm, I because I don't do it. Right, because I don't have the opportunity to, because I'm busy with my family all the time. Right, it it, it can get. I, I start feeling sad, and I'm thinking like, why am I feeling sad? <laughs> right, and then I start maybe just engaging with comedy and start writing and doing that, and I find, you know, I'm I'm happy, 
and but I do probably come across strange because I'm <laughs> like walking around the house, like talking to myself all the time, or maybe I'm I'm doing impersonations, you know. And my family thinks I'm weird, but like I'm happy at least, you know. That's like, all that counts. I, yeah. As long as you find some kind of joy, happiness, and solace in that process, I think that's the most important thing. Doctor Moo, we're gonna love you and leave you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. We're sending lots of love to you and your fam. And uh, hopefully we'll chat very soon, yeah? Yeah, man. And to you too. Thanks for this, bro. Salute. Have a good evening. Okay, cool. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of the Tell Us More Live Experience. That was a ton of fun, man. Talking to the Honorable Dr. Riyad Musa about kind of comedy life, uh, his uh, world as a medical doctor, or previous life at least. Um I like what he had to say about becoming or trying to be inclusive as an artist. I think often we want to err on one side and take a particular stance and, and we find like that's important, which is good. We're not judging. Um, but sometimes having a, a perspective that considers everybody is uh, kind of helpful in the same way. I really dig his work. And he said some interesting stuff about kind of being quarantined at home with your family. So those of you who are with your family, uh, or who are extroverts, who are used to being social creatures, hopefully you're doing okay because this lockdown has upended a lot of our routines, a lot of the things that we did to keep us sane. You know, if you're one of those people who played sports socially or went out to movies or whatever it was that you participated in, this might be bizarre for you to be at home and kind of have to find that relief from yourself or in your own space. Uh, but either way, to everyone else, we were sending you lots of love too. Thank you guys for tuning into another episode. We'll see you guys very soon. Stay safe out there. Namaste, your ass at home. We'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Bye.